Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum Podcast. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here, and we are going to do our mid-month podcast. Kevin, what's going on? Just getting ready for some U.S. Open watching after a very exciting Canadian Open where a guy made like a 90-foot putt in a fourth playoff hole to win. So hopefully the U.S. Open can uh, do as well as the Canadian did. Yeah, I don't even want to... approach the topic of live and uh the pga so we'll let's just let's just uh jump into it <laughs> i think other people have fully covered that yeah we'll we'll just we'll just jump into the fun stuff so uh central bank roundup <clears throat> what's going on in in the world of the fed shine those boots it's time for Ooh, central bank roundup well we've got a fed meeting tomorrow and we're expecting based on the narrative in newspapers, on Twitter and on TV, that they might not hike rates tomorrow for the first time in 10 meetings or so. Um, yeah, it looks like the the odds are, are pricing in that there's uh, what they're calling a pause, but now they're saying if they pause tomorrow, which by the time this airs, it'll be two days in, in the rears, that there's a good chance that they're gonna hike in July which is just yeah i saw it a crazy. skip not a pause <laughs> skip that yep exactly that's what they're calling it a, a skip is the new the new term they're coining as we're gonna we're not gonna move you know that i think a lot of the, a lot of the numbers are going to be this friday when you have um, a lot of the manufacturing numbers come out a lot of the data to see if you know how quickly growth is slowing as well um if growth if growth is is really starting to fall off then we could be we could be in in trouble yeah, right now we're experiencing disinflation. Uh, for those not <laughs> uh, familiar with that lingo, it just means that inflation used to be at 8%, now it's at 5%. And so it's not deflation because it's still increasing prices. They're just increasing at a much slower rate. And so this morning we got CPI numbers uh, said the month over month was 0.1%, which is good. That puts you at an annualized rate of just one2 which is great. Um, but the core CPI number, so the biggest portion of that is shelter, uh, still over 5%, 5.3 for today's number. So if I'm the Fed, I'm happy that these rate rises did decrease from, we'll call it eight, nine percent down to four or five, uh, but I'm not done with my job. So a skip or a pause, I think is premature. And they've suggested that there be at least two more hikes before they were to actually stop. And the markets are still pricing in two quarter point cuts before the end of the year. Uh, We're at the midpoint now it'll be odd over the next 12 weeks for them to take one more hike, then wait another six weeks, 18 weeks, and then to cut at the end of the year. I, I just don't know if cuttings in the cards, at least in 2023. We're in this, we're in this phase right now where you have the best economists in the world. No one has any idea what's going on. One, one economist was calling for a 50 basis point hike um, tomorrow. I mean, some are calling for 1% cut by the end of the year. So it, it's all over the place and, and the market is pricing in and is, and is adjusting almost on a daily basis. So it'll be interesting to, to see what happens with uh, if, it's a, if it's a skip or a true pause. What do you think the impact is if they skip, pause, keep raising? If um, <clears throat> if, if they raise, to, I mean, the market's already as priced in, in my opinion, a, a pause and cuts by the end of the year. So any more hikes this year, you're going to get a all those gains that we've enjoyed over the last couple of months. I think you'll give right back within a couple of days. I think that'll shock the market. Um, I don't think a skip's the worst thing, but, you know, I, I hope this is a pause and – and, and we're good. Yeah, what I've looked back, what I've seen is typically when they start to raise rates, the stock market does continue to do well, goes up, goes up. It's when they do pause and stop is when you kind of go, okay, maybe the economy is actually slowing down because they're not making money any tighter. And then the last part is typically when they start cutting rates, that's when we're actually in trouble. And so if we do cut rates before the end of the year, it means that they probably won the fight against inflation, got it below two. 
but they killed the economy in the process and we're now experiencing negative economic growth in the form of a recession or worse. Yep, I agree. Well, let's skip over to jump over to headlines. Leaving no stone unturned, it's time for headlines and the news you may have missed. Let's talk about the banks. Um, banks earning eighty billion uh, net revenue despite this so-called crisis. What are your What are your thoughts yeah. there? What do you think about that? I mean, you're just printing. Uh, net interest income as other banks are failing and falling apart. I mean, these profits, they're up 33% in the first quarter. Um, There were some one-off gains that helped as well, but the industry, Wiley, is just not failing. Um, It's just doing just fine. Their problems seem to be specific to a few banks. It's not widespread. It's not a 2008 type situation. It's a a few were poorly managed and got hit and they're gone now. Um, I would say loan growth is declining. So I think there's a shelf life to this increasing that interest income. But for the moment, JP Morgan, some of these other ones, just printing money. Yeah. You know, it's like, like we've said before, it wasn't a solvency issue ever. It was a liquidity issue. So I don't think that, I mean, the banks are healthy and you're looking at the numbers to your point, JP Morgan, 52% jump in Q1 profits. Wells Fargo nice. did 5 <laughs> billion in Q1 in, in, in the bottom line. Um, so I, you know, and especially the, the bigger banks, I mean, the bigger banks were direct beneficiaries of depositors leaving the, the, the smaller regionals and going to, uh, you know, the big four, if, if you will. So, I, yeah. Yeah. And look for JP Morgan this is a time where their investment banks not doing nearly as much business as they used to be doing. And so to have this net interest income is really nice for them because otherwise you got big problems of we don't have any interest income. We don't have any fee income. We're not making any money. So, um, banks are making money. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we know all about the recent, we'll call it CHIP Act, some of the, we'll call it trade war stuff, limiting technology and semiconductors to China. But recently, uh, the British American tobacco CEO had to have an abrupt departure from his job because they were secretly selling cigarettes to North Korea. Uh, There was a big fine for the company. It was $635 million penalty. I think it was estimated for I don't know if it was $4 billion of cigarettes. I don't know how you figure out what cigarettes are actually worth, but they had violated the law enough times that uh, they got caught supporting the embassy and other things like that. So a very weird one. I, I smuggling cigarettes is just not something I thought would be a big deal. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> I wouldn't sounds, even think it's a thing that happens. It's very it bizarre. Sounds, but It sounds like, you know, an episode of Sopranos and cigarettes falling off the back of a truck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if, if there's if there's if they're smuggling cigarettes. I mean, I can't imagine everything else that they're they're smuggling over there. Well, they said they, the reason they got caught is they got caught smuggling 30 million dollars worth of cigarettes through North Korea's Singapore embassy. And then they found like another 250 million dollars of what we'll call it cash transfers that they didn't necessarily find the uh, <laughs> the, the cigarettes. Uh, they didn't find them, you know, the smoking gun, whatever else. Um, they didn't catch them red handed whatever term you want to use, but a $635 million penalty is pretty severe. Uh, you know, if we're going to do that, and I say we as, you know, Western countries that impose sanctions uh, on cigarettes, which, look, it, they have value. I mean, there's something to it. I mean, if you're North Korean, you like to smoke, it's, I guess, pretty valuable. But what I would be curious to know is if certain countries that pass on technology like semiconductors or AI technology or robotics, other things that are currently now being not allowed, to places like China, North Korea, et cetera, if we're going to find people $635 million for $30 million of cigarettes, what are the fines? What are the penalties if you start doing high tech? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, those are, those are massive fines and I, you know, I, there's gotta be something else behind that, by the way, that just doesn't sound right. You know, 30 million cigarettes and that big of a fine. I don't know. It sounds, sounds a little, uh, sounds a little suspect to me. Yeah. Like I said, they, they caught them on one thing, but obviously they go, there's smoke a lot of these other places and we've almost got you here, but all right, let's move on. So let's... we got some merger mania, not just live and PGA. It was announced there'll be a $10 billion merger between two lithium miners, Australia's Alchem and us rival Liven struck a deal to consolidate. Um, 
What's your general take on mergers and why they happen? And what's your take here? I mean, you know, mergers happen for, for a couple of reasons. One is there's a, a bigger company acquiring a smaller company for pennies in the dollar due to poor management, stock price, whatever it may be, or, or two, because they feel that they can, they can grow the top line, um, decrease expenses, which is at the end of the day, increases the bottom line. And if you look at this, this merger that took place, I think I, I read that they're going to add 125 million to the top line and 200 million in savings just by just by merging. Um, they're going to save on capex and they're going to help speed up the projects. And I, you know that's just typical in in, in mergers and, and acquisitions. And I think you're going to see more consolidation. I think there's a lot of companies that have just over levered themselves, and with rates as high as they are, you know you're seeing it a lot in in specific industries and sectors. And I think it's going to be a uh, continued trend going forward. Yeah, specific to this one, I think you're right about the overall of why you do it. Um, you know, electrical vehicles have been a huge demand driver for lithium and a lot of different other rare earths. But, you know, this merger will be 7% of the world's lithium output. And so I think exactly nail on the head of increasing scale is the key here. So you got to be bigger to survive. And, you know, a lot of these materials are really owned by countries. So Chile, for example, I think copper mining, as well as lithium mining, et cetera, you know, it's really owned at the highest level in terms of government. So having Western countries uh, allowing companies to do this stuff, to have 7% of the market's great, uh, but they got to achieve that scale in order to be competitive with uh, some of the, uh, I guess we'll call them government owned, government sponsored entities. Yeah, nope, I agree. Well, let's move on to something or nothing. Fed bank bailouts. Um, you know, you, you're you're dubbing it as the double secret QE. Fed has been backstopping banks by taking their government bonds out of par. Is this something or nothing? I think this is a big something because to me, this is quantitative easing, but secretly. Um, so they, uh, I guess, let me <laughs> let me explain the phrase you just said. So one of the challenges with Silicon Valley Bank is they owned a lot of long-term uh, U.S. government bonds. And so they bought them, we'll just use simple numbers, for $100, and they were suddenly worth $70 when interest rates moved up. What the Fed has started to do at some of these banks is buy back those government-issued bonds for 100 even though if they were going to sell it to you or I or another institution, it would trade around 70 today. And so what they're doing is basically bailing out those banks and fixing their balance sheets and backstopping the problem before it becomes worse. So this isn't a situation where private sector loans that they made are going bad or commercial real estate issues. This is pure balance sheet stuff. And they're going, what if we increased your balance sheet by 30% by just swapping out old bonds for new bonds? And now you don't have those unrealized losses on your balance sheet anymore. So I think it's definitely something. Yeah. I agree with you. You know, I think it, why they're doing it is because they feel if they can correct a few of the bad apples now, um, they'll fix the, they'll hopefully fix the bigger overarching you know issue, which is bonds getting killed and the collateral that was there is worth half of what it used to be. Um, but you're right; it's it's a complete it's a it's a secret secret QE bailout. I like that. Yeah. I think it, it, you know, the money's tight at the highest level for the Fed. We can see that with rates rises and the other things they're doing. But underneath there, they're regulating a lot of these banks and they're saying, we're going to fix this problem before it gets out of hand. Yep, I agree. All right, let's talk about inflation overseas. So policymakers in Europe are using price controls to try and combat inflation. You got prices up across the board with necessities, uh, sugar, cheese, eggs, potatoes, bread, etc., is this something or nothing? This is definitely something. Um, and I think the something is how to address inflation if you're a government, either elected official or bureaucrat, and people are upset that they go to the grocery store and their sugar is 50% more, or their eggs and cheese and their potatoes are 20 to 25% more than they were a year ago. I mean, bread, a loaf of bread is now 16% more. So, you know, I don't think that price controls work. Uh, I think anytime you get government intervention like this, it leads to unintended outcomes. And usually what happens with inflation is now they're going to go to their unions and say, we got to raise rates. And then it just kind of keeps growing on itself. So I don't think that this is a solution to inflation. I think the real solution is they can increase the supply of sugar. 
that can increase the supply of milk, increase the supply of eggs. And some of that's easier said than done. But, you know, if you plant a little more grain, you can have a lot more bread. Well, they're they're targeting the wrong group, which is the, which is the retailers. And if they're capping the retailers, the retailers are saying, well, I'm still getting at wholesale prices for this and I have to sell it below what I'm getting at wholesale. So I'm actually losing money on this. And, you know, what you're starting to see is they're going to start limiting what you can buy or stop carrying certain things in in uh, in their store, because why are you going to have a net loss on your books? Now, if the government were to step in and subsidize those losses, then that makes sense capping it. But leaving it up to the the end retailers to, to take it, um, I think to your point, you said it best, it's going to have unintended uh, consequences. Yep, they're accountable to somebody, and that somebody is us, and we're upset about the higher prices. So they're trying to do something, but if you look back at the Great Depression, those price controls just it didn't work. And, uh, you know, anyway, let's move on to toss-up, our next little game. So, Tom, I got a quick question for you. Better proxy for market stress, the VIX, which we've talked about on several episodes, or volume? You know, I would say I would take that in twofold. I would say the, for the everyday um, everyday investor, I would say the VIX. You know, because typically there's a there's a good correlation when the VIX is up, the market's down, and there's and people who watch their four hundred one ks or their investments in general feel feel the pain. So I think there's more emotions involved. On the other side, for for traders, I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's volume. Um, a lack of volume is a lack of breath, and that's not typically good. And it's hard to make money in that environment. Versus when there's high volume, you you have high volatility, but there's there's more opportunity. But I think they're one and the same anyway. So I, it, that's a tough one. But um, what are your thoughts? I've been looking at the VIX for a while, and I've been using that as the kind of indicator for market stress. But once I kind of thought about this, and from the person who made the comment, I I think volume is the simpler answer. And to see real stress, you can see March of 2020 and go back to 08. And it's a really easy chart. You can do it, you know, monthly using technical analysis. And you just see the bars start jumping. And because you use color coding, the green ones are good, red ones are bad. And you see, wow, these red ones, it lines up really well. And so I think, you know, if you looked at leading up to the debt ceiling stuff, the VIX was complacent, volume was low. They tend to say the same thing. I think it might be just a little bit easier to say how much volume is there? Okay, now we're in some stress. Versus VIX, it's a little more mathematical. It's not as simple as, well, you got to divide by two or 1.6, and then that gives you this anticipated move per day. Volume's like, is there a lot of volume? Yeah, okay, it must be a stressful time. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I think there's there's outliers too. Um, when you see those big, big spikes in volume, um, it's more apparent. So let's move on to the next one. U.S. cities experiencing the donut effect. Uh, commercial business districts struggling while the rings of the outer urban and suburban areas um, are thriving. So question is, downtown or the burbs? I'm a, I'm a suburbs guy. Now, I like a close suburb, so I don't want to be too far away from the city. But downtown's tough. <laughs> it got a lot of action, a lot going on. It's hard to walk down. There's one-way streets going each direction. There's people you probably don't want to run into. You get out to the suburbs, you got a little space to stretch your arms out, go for a walk with your dog. There's nice, you know, white picket fences as a joke, but, you know, nice green manicured lawns. Uh, things are a little bit cleaner. So for me, suburbs are the way to go. Yeah, and I think it's a real, real issue. I mean, we're seeing it on the commercial side for office buildings, you know, and now with everyone having the option to to go into work or work from home, um, they're leaving the cities. And I think the main reason is the uh, the commute, the, the the cost of it or the lack thereof in some cases. I mean, give you an example. When I used to live in New Jersey and I had to commute to New York, I mean, it was an hour door to door. It was extremely expensive. Um, I was paying double the taxes. It's just it was not efficient. And I think you're seeing that with areas like San Francisco and New York, which New York's got the subway. And I think you're seeing people go out to the outer burbs like Long Island and, and New Jersey. Um, with that said, I'm going city because I'm a city guy and I think you could find some opportunity right now. In fact, <laughs> city guy you, actually, hard, huh? you know, you, I was talking to a buddy who's in commercial real estate and they're thinking there's some there's some corporations that are thinking about uh, converting 
office space to residential because they just don't think they're they're ever going to come back. So that should be should be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I like that idea. It's from what I understand really expensive to convert, but I think there's a lot of value in a place like New York where it's already expensive. The capex on the project would make a lot of sense. So I don't know how many people want to live in a skyscraper in downtown Dallas or downtown Houston, but eh, we'll see. All right, should we go uh, put on your, I guess, get your crystal ball and put on your hat and see Nostra Thomas? Let's go. I'm ready. And now, we ask our soothsayer to gaze into his crystal ball. Let's hear from the alchemist himself, Nostra Thomas. 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 All right, Nostra Thomas, thanks for joining us today. The Fed has raised rates a lot. However, the longest they've ever held, we'll quote, high rates was in 2007. It only lasted for nine months. How long will the Fed keep rates high this time around? Yeah. So if you go back to that last tightening cycle, I think it started in 2003, early 2004, they raised rates Greenspan a quarter basis point, 0.25% every quarter for 17 quarters in a row. And then they paused when they got to five and a half percent. And Bernanke, the only reason why he lowered rates is because we went through the Great Recession. So I don't think there was this, hey, we're going to keep it there for six or nine months. They kept it there until something really broke, which was the global housing market. Um, Unfortunately, I think the same may be true this time around. I don't think they're going to they've already gone this far. I don't think they're going to backpedal and say, we need to drop rates. And the minute that they do bring rates down it, I think that is a very bad signal that something really broke in in the market. So I think they're going to hold longer than usual this time around. And, um, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, we're at, we're at the same, let me put it this way. I don't think we're going to cut this time. We're going to cut this year unless something really terrible happens in the economy and you see a massive recession take hold and we had this hard landing. All right. We'll see if they can break the nine month, we'll call it world record. All right. Thank you, Nostra Thomas, for that answer. Our next question is the G7 in 2000 had over 40% of global GDP. Now it's down to only 30% as China, India, and other countries have grown. The U.S. dollar and the euro still dominate global currency reserves. Can the G7 dominate the future or has a huge shift taken place? Well, you know, in regards to currencies and, and for those who are unaware, the G7 is made up of the U.S., U.K., Germany, Italy, Canada, France, and Japan. Um, I would say a close third and fourth for currency is the is the yen and, and British pound. So those four currencies have pretty much dominated um, the world currency. And I, you know, there's you look at China and India and that big jump of uh, global GDP going from forty to to thirty percent. Um, I think, and I don't know the stats, but I would assume that 90% of that 10% gap probably is off of China and India alone. I mean, those economies are growing and they're they're expected to grow. But I don't think that there's going to be a shift in currency um, because, one, the G7 and the U.S. and and the U.K. and those areas represent some of the biggest economic centers in the world. And there's something called the rule of law. Um, which you don't really have in, in, in certain, <laughs> certain areas like like China. And then also in international trade. I mean, you look at the dollar. I mean, 60% of all transactions in the world are done in in the U.S. currency. Half of global debt and 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 loans out there are, are based in U.S. dollars. And the central banks have, you know, 60% of their reserves uh, sitting in dollars. So I, the only thing that breaks and bucks that trend is if people start losing faith in the U.S., uh, economy. And if we continue with our debt and we get downgraded, you know, that could possibly change. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great answer. Thank you, Nostra Thomas. All right. Our final question for Nostra Thomas is there's a new hot casual lunch in Japan. It is a soup made of salmon and fresh milk clam chowder. It's called <laughs> Zelda soup and it comes from the Nintendo game named Zelda. Uh, apparently it's a really popular game. Uh, still, I remember it like, I think in like in 64 or 30 years ago, 20 years ago, but I guess it's still very popular in Japan to the point where people are going and ordering Zelda soup. So those are Thomas, I guess, you know, have you ever had Zelda soup? And if so, or if not, what other great dishes are we going to 
get from video games or wider pop culture? What are you looking to try? Honestly, I don't, I don't know where you read or find this stuff. Um, <laughs> this one was in the Financial I, Times. It's uh, in the opinion section. Uh, that's you know, uh, no, I, I know you're not making it up. I, I believe you. Um, you know, disclosure: I didn't play very many video games uh, at all as a kid. Maybe Super Mario Brothers. So I don't know what Zelda is or what the soup is. I have not had it. Uh, the best way I can answer this question, um, you know. I think you've seen the, the biggest shift I've seen over the last 10 years in, in just the, the food industry is the farm to table. Um, and that was done a while ago. I haven't seen anything really since then, as far as just big culture shift, at least in here in the U S um, what I am seeing a little bit of is more family style and more of people going out and just ordering appetizers and, and drinks and not sitting down for your typical full on meal. But as far as, as far as video games go, I wouldn't even know where to start on that one. Yeah. I think this stuff definitely exists in parties. So you get a shaped cake that looks like something from Mario brothers or from Zelda or one of these other games. I think that, uh, that kind of stuff will always have a space as far as the theme, but I I have not seen any of that stuff in the U.S. The, yet. And I know the Japanese, the Japanese love the it. Japanese are <laughs> they weird, man. They, they're into the anime and all, all that. Um, I just, yeah. If I hope if nobody I'm, broadcasts this in Japan, man. <laughs> if, if I'm, I mean, I love them. How about the they way, have a they, unique culture that's different from our own? How no, about, that's a nice way. To say. No, they're <laughs> but they're also weird. And and by the way, some of the best cuisine I've ever had is in Japan, and it's not sushi. That was obviously phenomenal, but it was a steak. It was the hibachi. Um, I mean, they have some of the best food ever in Japan. So if I'm going to Japan again, it's not to eat Zelda soup. I can, I can assure you that. (laughs) All right. Well, that was a good one to finish up on. uh, (laughs) Thank you. Nostra Thomas. We'll see you next time. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll leave it off there and we'll be back in a couple weeks with our month end. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.